everybody. I'm Kate Conroy. And I'm Vinny Sabatella. And this is Other People's Business, which is the podcast from the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, which is the largest business association in the country. For more info on us, visit njbia.org. We release a new episode every other Friday, so be on the lookout. Shout out to New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance. They provide home, auto, and workers' comp insurance, and they are the official sponsor of the show. So check them out if you need some insurance. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping matters or whatever. We air this show every other week on your you know, network of choice, iTunes, Google Play. We used to say a lot, we're on the Amazon Echo. For the first time, like a couple weeks ago, I actually tested that, and sure enough, we are. I did the so, same yeah. thing! <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. So yeah, you can get us anywhere. Um, if the network you're listening to us on has like a system of reviews or whatever, please, if you love us, give us the full five-star review. It helps us literally get ourselves out there and get discovered by more awesome listeners just like you. Just like you. If you hate us, by all means, write into opb at njbia.org. <laughs> Give us the address where you work and a time where Kate and I can come <laughs> hang out behind you. And we'll, by all means, critique you right back. No, I'm kidding. By all uh, means, write into opb at njbia.org. We love your feedback, and we'd be happy to take it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that we would send you something not so nice. Yeah, not so nice? <laughs> <laughs> Give us the address. <laughs> exactly. Oh, care package. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little care package. Yeah. Absolutely. You two crack me up. I know. That's <laughs> why we have our show. <laughs> okay, for, for uh, listeners who are not watching this on YouTube, that was the illustrious voice of our, of our very uh, own Frank Robinson today. Yes, exactly. He's our guest. Absolutely. So uh, he's one of the uh, the veteran stars of our government affairs department here at NJBIA. Frank, you want to say hi? Hello, say hi. everyone. I, I just want to say right from the start how honored I am to be a guest here as, as the other people's business enters its second season. Huh? I can't tell you, and sorry, I won't tell you what an <laughs> honor it is, but uh, everybody... Listen in all the time. Kate and Vin, or Vin and Kate, do a tremendous job here for the association. Thank I'm you. just as honored You're to be welcome. here. <laughs> I am too. I am too. Um, so, listeners of the show, longtime listeners, will know that we usually um, start with a little icebreaker to get us warmed up, but I feel like that would be kind of wasted on you because you've got um, a lot to say about, about Trenton. You've been here a long time. Rumor has it you just had a 40th anniversary of working in Trenton? That is true, Ms. Kate. Uh, in uh, June of 1978, I was involved with the first, my first budget as a legislative aide. I came to work in the beginning of 78 here in town for a, a tremendous woman named Greta Kiernan. She was an assemblywoman from Bergen County, and she had gotten elected in Brendan Burns' landslide in 1977 in the mm -hmm. governor's race. And so this was, 78 was her first year. She was sworn in beginning of that year, and it was also her first budget. It was a budget that was a little controversial. It was Brendan Burns his first budget after he got reelected, uh, we had had an income tax put into place. Uh, we were spending a lot of money on schools. I forget the amount of the budget, but it was big. And Assemblywoman Kiernan said, Frank, I don't want to vote for that. It's too much money. And I'm like, well, you need to vote your district and your conscience. And I was a 23-year-old kid who really didn't know what he was doing and probably really shouldn't be given advice to an assemblywoman. You advised a politician to vote their conscience, really? Absolutely, I did. I was <laughs> idealistic, too, at one point does in time. That? And so she informed uh, the Speaker of the Assembly, who was uh, a gentleman from Hudson County named Chris Jackman, who went a little nuts that she wasn't going to vote with the Democratic Party. And so Speaker Jackman told the governor's office that she wouldn't be voting. Well, very shortly after that, the assemblywoman got summoned to the governor's office and I was summoned with her. Uh -oh. And at that point in time, the governor's chief of staff was a guy named, a wonderful gentleman named Bob Mulcahy, and his deputy chief of staff was one Harold Hodes, who's sort of a legend in Trenton, too. Harold was chief of staff to uh, Mayor of Newark way back when, chief of staff to Brendan Byrne, uh, was uh, one of the guys that really started lobbying, the lobbying business here in Trenton a, a hundred years ago. And so <laughs> Greta and I were called in to the governor's office. We sat at the conference table in the governor's office and Brendan Byrne came over and he couldn't have been nicer. Greta, you know, it's so good to see you. You've been supportive of me. And his two staff guys started beating the hell out of her. You have to vote for the budget, this, that, and the other thing. And she <laughs> turns to them and said, well, Frank told me I didn't have to vote for her. <laughs> well, I was on the...
Bus. Pardon my French, I don't know if we can say that word. We'll just beep it out. It's yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We're PG-13. And yeah. so that was exactly. that was my uh, introduction, and I was thinking about that all day uh, on the second to the last day of the budget this year as I was sitting in the General Assembly with my colleagues from NJBIA because we had a full group of uh, BIA representatives uh, looking after the business interests in the state um, that whole weekend of whether or not we were going to get a budget or not, and someone asked me, When's the first time you came down for this stuff? And it has been 40 years. Wow. Yeah. That's an And they said it wouldn't last, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you've had a lot of different careers in, in Trenton over the course of 40 years, right? That is true. And the whole time I wasn't stationed here in Trenton, but I had a connection to it. I, I worked for Congressman Florio at one point in time when he was uh, gearing up to run for governor. So I spent a lot of time in town. This was his second time he ran for governor. Um, I worked for U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg. I was a... Uh, an advanced man for President Jimmy Carter and for Vice President Walter Mondale in the late 70s in 1980 because people thought for a while that Jimmy Carter was the president of New Jersey way back when because he used to come here all the time. <laughs> Brendan Byrne, when he was governor, was the first governor in the nation that endorsed Jimmy Carter for president in 1975. And so, as sort of a return of friendship after uh, Jimmy Carter was elected president, he came here at least once a year, if not more, um, and helped to raise money for the Democratic Party, uh, was supportive of a lot of Brendan Burns' policies in his second term. And when the president couldn't make it, they would send Walter Mondale. Well, because they were coming here so often, they needed to have some local guys trained. So actually, I was one of a few young men at the time. Uh, and actually, we had some young women, too, who were trained by the Secret Service and the White House staff to be advanced men and women for the president and the vice president. We had some great trips up the old uh, giant stadium. Uh, we, we, we did things in, in uh, Newark at the Newark Museum and uh, just had a great, great time. And so that was one of my many careers. What does an advanced man do? An advanced man <laughs> is the guy, the guys that uh, a day or two or three before a big trip, and lots of politicians have advanced uh, people. But presidents and vice presidents have lots of people because you deal very closely with the Secret Service uh, and their advance. And so they come in a few days before a trip. Let's say the president was coming to a giant stadium. Uh, they would come in. They would coordinate local police, state police, firemen, emergency services, uh, and, and, and make sure that it's a secure location. Mm -hmm. Deal with the credentials for the crowd, uh, who gets in, who doesn't get in, check people's backgrounds. And then the advanced people make sure that the cars are in the right place to pick up the president at the airport, make sure that everybody gets to the location on time. And actually, I had the privilege at one point in time, one trip, to be the guy that briefed the president on exactly what he was going to be doing once he got out of the car. You're going to be meeting the president of the Senate, the governor, the speaker of the assembly. We're going to go into a room where you've got all the big shots in the Democratic Party, and you're going to have a drink, and Jimmy Carter didn't drink, with them before we go out and go on a stage. And so you advance the whole trip sure. from mm -hmm. soup to nuts. I even got to hold a Secret Service agent Uzi submachine gun once. Wow. Jeez. I didn't get to shoot it, but I, I actually hold, held Good it. Good lord. I was going to say, this whole thing is turning into like a, a spy kind of I know. movie here. Yeah. Well, at Seriously. some point in time, I thought I was in the CIA or FBI or something or other, and that's why when I started wearing my sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, if you're uh, listening to this on iTunes, you, you can't, can't see. Can't Frank see. is wearing sunglasses uh, right now, which is a look I might steal at some I know. point for these episodes. Yeah. I feel like we should have done the same thing. Yeah. I wear these glasses for lots of different reasons. Not the least of all is that they're pres pres prescription progressive lenses, mm. and when bright lights, you know, you get to be my age it kind of hurts your, your oh, eyes. I'm going to turn the lights and, off. That's, that's, that's fine. Oh, people we will start talking well if we turn the lights off, <laughs> especially with Kate. And yeah. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Um, my, you know, but I, I've had a lot of different careers. I, I've had my own marketing business and fundraising business. I've been a political consultant, was executive director of the Assembly Democrats uh, for many, many years. Um, and among my most rewarding years, and I have to say this because Michelle Sikirk will be working, is working here at NJBIA the last 16 years. I was just going to say, do you have a favorite career after BIA, which would be at the top, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have a favorite mm -hmm. career I mean, after BIA? Absolutely. Well, no. Um, yeah, probably... Um, 
kayaking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not taught, a career, taught, is it? I it can be. I taught yeah. kayaking and canoeing when you I was in the did? Boy Scouts. I did at a Boy Scout camp. I missed. And I don't know if people, this is off the subject, but... <laughs> There's 19- no such thing as off the subject on our show. <laughs> For you young people, you weren't even alive. Summer of 1970, I worked at a Boy Scout camp in New York State. That was the summer after Woodstock. Mm. All the guys I worked with had gone to Woodstock, which was only 20 miles sure. from this camp. I missed it by a year. Oh, you know, I, I could have so been at Woodstock, but so I taught sad. canoeing and kayaking at that summer camp. So <laughs> that was my other favorite career. But here at BIA, I mean, it's really been great because when I came here, BIA was viewed by a lot of Democrats in the state as being sort of a conservative Republican organization, which it never was. When I worked for the legislature for the Democrats, I had great relationships with people here at BIA. But there was sort of a perception a little bit more conservative than um, some of the Democrats liked. And so when Jim McGreevy became governor and Democrats took control, back control of the legislature uh, in January of 2002, um, I got uh, enticed to come work here at NJBIA by two great guys. Uh, One was Joe Gonzalez, who was president of BIA at the time, who himself had been executive director of the Republican uh, office in the General Assembly, and Phil Kirshner, who was the head of government affairs at that time. And so they enticed me to come across the street. Our building used to be right across from the State House, and uh, went to work there during the McGreevy administration. And lots of my Democratic friends are like, I can't believe you've gone to the dark side. <laughs> I'm like, I'm on the dark side. The best social program is a good job. Yeah. And so for the last 16 years, that's what we've done, government affairs, trying to make sure that New Jersey sure. is as friendly as possible to um, those people that create jobs. I mean, one of the things that we do in our motto is that we say that we represent a million jobs in the Mm -hmm. state of New Jersey. Our members uh, employ that many people, and uh, we want to make sure that those people keep those jobs Mm -hmm. and that they're healthy jobs. I mean, one of the things that we always talk about in our government affairs stuff, and we get this from our members every year in our business outlook survey, is the cost of health insurance. Mm -hmm. It goes up, up, up for lots of different factors, but New Jersey has a tendency to go up faster than other states because we have so many mandates on people's health insurance. And it is difficult sometimes to to lobby against some of the mandates. So, Frank, actually, before I got into to, to politics, I didn't mm-hmm. know what that meant. Can you mm-hmm. explain to listeners who might not understand what a mandate is? A mandate is, is that the legislature decides, hmm, something well, has to we be. think that this has to happen in your workplace. Some of the mandates that we're dealing right now is paid family leave, with something that was always between the employer and the employee, mandatory, so that every employee of every employer has to get paid family leave um, and pay, a mandatory paid sick leave. Most of our, I think our last survey here at BAA of our 18, 19,000 members, companies, 87% of them had some kind of paid time off policy, a PTO, Mm -hmm. whether it was vacation days, sick days, bereavement days, whatever it might have. And some people just have a overall policy that says you get so much time off every year, use it as you will. But every company can't afford that, and every it can't be cookie cutter. And so we try to explain to the legislature that you, it's not can't be one size fits all. And that's what the mandates do. Whether it's saying you have to cover particular things in the the medical insurance, I mean, we all know that we want maternity to be covered. That if people get sick with cancer, but there's lots of things that um, new medical techniques, uh, trial um, uh, clinical trials that have to be covered by New Jersey insurance where no other state makes people to cover that. Mm. Um, And so those are among the mandates that we deal with. There's lots of rules and regulations. I mean, we're talking about now, and we'll have a big debate starting next month about minimum wage in New Jersey. Mm. Few, few, no states totally have gone to $15 a minimum wage, but a number of jurisdictions have. Part of New York State, the city of Seattle, San Francisco, uh, have ratcheted up their minimum wage. Um, federal minimum wage is seven twenty-five an hour. New Jersey's minimum wage is eight sixty-eight an hour, and the governor and the legislature proposed going to fifteen dollars an hour here in New Jersey. Now, granted, 
they are listening to a lot of the arguments of the business community is that you can't just raise it seven dollars an hour overnight mm. you're yeah. going to put people out of business yeah. uh, especially mom and pops they talk about well the big corporations can afford it quite frankly all in bia we represent small businesses we represent large corporations and we're proud that we represent both and we think we can represent them well is that most of the major corporations pay a lot more than 15 dollars mm -hmm. an hour even for the entry-level jobs that they have i was in jersey city yesterday we we're talking about a payroll tax that the state's going to allow the city to do up there and financial services is a big big employer and once again members of njbia the average salary it's not the starting salary but the average salary for the financial uh, industry in Jersey City is $170,000 a year. That's a lot over $15 an hour. Sure, we're in the wrong business. And I so <laughs> I met with some small business people in Jersey City and said if it goes to $15 an hour, they're going to close. Yeah. Because they, they employ a lot of, of people that don't have the higher end skills. Everybody hopes that someday they can make $170,000 a year, but but starting out, they can't. And so we need to be, you know, we try to educate the legislature and the governor on the really the costs of doing business in New Jersey, which by every member measure is the highest in the country between taxes and the regulations, the mandates that we talked about, um, the different fees that people have to say, just the cost of living in New Jersey is higher, and that affects the cost of doing business, too. Yeah. So I'm actually going to steal a question from Kate because whenever we have employment lawyers on the uh, the air, she always asks them, "What's the craziest story you've come across during your career? Is there something like you could think of off the top of your head in your 40 years working in Trenton that would be uh, the craziest thing?" Well, actually, some people might be. This was this goes back a hundred years ago too. It was the budget battle in 1979. Now, by the Constitution of the state of New Jersey, the, the most recent version, which was put in in 1947, is that you have to pass a balanced budget by midnight of June the 30th every year to stay in compliance with the Constitution. So that means at 12.01, July 1st, you've got to put a budget on the governor's desk and the governor's got to sign it in order for government to stay open. Many, many years um, come right up to that deadline, but officially, until recently, never went past that deadline. And one of the reasons they didn't go past the deadline, I was one of the people that was designated back in the late 70s, that as it got to be close to midnight, unplug the official clock. <laughs> <laughs> And so there were numerous times, and I was really only involved with it once, where we passed the budget after midnight, but it was really like 10 minutes to 12. Jeez. And people would be yelling and screaming, you know, somebody unplug that clock. And so, and what are you it's talking like about? It's very obviously like, like 6 a.m. the next day. Like that. And what are so, you talking about? <laughs> so, but I've got lots of different stories. But if I told you, told them, I would have to kill you all. Right. Uh, people should say sometimes say a I should to kill write a book. I'm <laughs> I'm referred to by some people in the state as the Forrest Gump of New Jersey. Wow. In that I was, and I don't want to make it sound like that I was a major player. Well, occasionally I was. Most of the time I wasn't. I was an observer mm -hmm. of things. So in the movie Forrest Gump, you'll see that he's standing there with Lyndon Johnson, mm -hmm. standing there with John F. Kennedy. You know, he was in lots of different places at the time. I was I happened to be in a lot of different places and observe a lot of things. Which I, and I have a pretty good memory, so I remembered a lot. So people say, like, Frank, you should write a book. Well, if I write a book, someone would have me killed, I'm sure. Wow. You'd have to do it like uh, the way that Mark Twain did it and have it published posthumously a hundred years, <laughs> years well, one, one, after of, one of my crazy stories on West State Street was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and there was a movie done about this. It was, it was the whole ab scam. Uh, yeah! Ab scam happened in New Jersey. It actually happened in Washington, happened in New Jersey, happened yeah. in Pennsylvania. But New Jersey became the epicenter of the whole ab scam thing because... And for our, our listeners, ab scam? Ab scam was a... Um, 
a, uh, a con, a conspiracy run by the FBI to induce public officials um, to be willing to accept bribes. It yes. really was entrapment. A lot of people thought it was entrapment. But the emissaries of the FBI were FBI agents who were either African American or Italian Americans who dressed up as Arabs and came looking for investments for their cash. And so they were going to places like the city of Camden, mm -hmm. the city of Trenton, but most importantly, Atlantic City. Yeah. I'm what trying to remember the name, the, of the name of the movie. It was with um, Bradley Cooper and... Uh, Jennifer Lawrence was in it. Yeah. Right? Um, American, American something. American Gangster? No. no. American Hustle. American Hustle. American that was Hustle. the one. Good yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah, it was a great was movie. It, yeah. And uh, it wasn't... Don't put Madeline in the science on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it technically wasn't accurate in everything, but you kind of got the flavor of it. And um, there were some people in town that uh, were uh, being questioned uh, by the FBI when they weren't in their Arab uh, uniform. And they were um, having to go before the, the federal prosecutors. So they would have their lawyers come here from town. The best criminal lawyers at the time were all in Newark. So some of those lawyers would take, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave all the names out. Sure. Yeah. Would take the train from Newark to Trenton. I would get a phone call, because I also had an office on West State Street, besides in the State House, and say, Frank, go to the train station. You know what Mr. So-and-so looks like, yes. Pick up Mr. So-and-so, who's an attorney, and he's an attorney for this individual. Pick them up, take them in my, at a, actually, I love the car. I had a 1969 Chevy Camaro. It wasn't a Lincoln, it wasn't a limousine, it wasn't everything. It was a hot little, like, two-seater thing. And I would pick up these big shot lawyers at the Trenton Chain Station. In a Camaro. Take, take them in my Camaro. Take them. There's a there's it's a an sexy alley. car, right? Alley yeah. runs behind all the beautiful old buildings on West State uh -huh. Street. And so I would go down that alley so no one would see me, and I would drop these lawyers off at the back door of the law firms. And so one time they told me to park my car, come inside. They were going to be for a while, but that the attorney needed to get back on a train pretty quickly to Newark because he was trial or another client. And so they told me to go in this particular law office and just sit in their waiting room. Well, I'm sitting in the waiting room and a, and actually I'm going to use a name now, mm. is the uh, retired former governor of the state of New Jersey and the just retired same guy. Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, one of the best governors of all time and the best Chief Justice, Richard Hughes, Dick Hughes, was of counsel to that law firm. And so I'm sitting in the lobby all by myself waiting for this attorney to come down and Governor Hughes comes over and introduces himself to me. Now I'd met him a number of times, but he had really no idea who I was. Young man, how are you? Uh, Dick Hughes, the governor, how are you? And I mm -hmm. said, he said, what are you doing? And I told him I'm waiting. Oh, that secret meeting upstairs. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why don't you come into my office? And he came to my office, and I spent an hour and a half with Governor Hughes. And actually, I've told his sons this story in that I spent the best hour and a half of my life, I think, in 40 years wow. down here mm -hmm. with him telling me stories from the 1950s and 60s and when he was uh, governor uh, all during the 60s. And the Hughes family, Governor Hughes was widowed. And his second wife was a, a, a widow, I mean, widow and widower. And they each had like four kids. And Betty Hughes, who was wonderful first lady, and Dick Hughes got married to each other after their spouses had passed away. And so they had eight, eight or nine kids wow. between the two of them. My parents had 11 kids. Sounds like the Robinson house. Most yeah. Of them, yeah. Um, and Betty Hughes was my mother's hero when uh, we were growing up as kids. And my father was uh, became a Democratic County Committeeman because he was such a big supporter of Governor Hughes in the early 60s. And I got to spend an hour and a half with the governor um, and just a great, great guy. Um, and so that was one of my best stories, and it was all over Abskin. That's amazing. <laughs> That's not in the movie. No. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'd love to rewatch the movie, uh, see if there's it. a guy hanging around uh, in the background uh, yeah. that maybe looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> so. I wish Jennifer Lawrence were around back in those days. <laughs> Wouldn't that have anyway. been nice? Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have to take a quick break. Sure. And uh, when we come back, we're going to play a game. Awful. Great. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, All right, we're back, and it's time to play 
the game that is not regionally famous? Awful or awesome? I am looking forward to it. I know you are. So uh, for, for new listeners, this is a game where I'm going to say three things, and we each have to declare it to be awful or awesome and be prepared to defend our answers. Ready? Yes, Born ready. All right. First up, blackberries. Best invention on the planet. <laughs> wow. I'm dropping in first. It is awesome. awesome. These newfangled <laughs> smartphones, you get big fingers like mine, you can't text. I don't know how kids do it. Blackberries, for you people out there that don't remember them, had raised keyboards they on did. them. Mm. They were cool. And everybody who had one past like 2006 or seven was considered a dinosaur. Yeah, we Apparently openly mocked a dinosaur. them. Just recently, I understand that certain people in state government have gotten the new model BlackBerry, and I saw one about two months ago. And I'm, I won't even say which person it is, Steve Sweeney. <laughs> Showed me his new BlackBerry, and I think it is great, and I'm going to get one soon. Wow. I, I can't believe that I didn't even have to clarify that I was not talking about the fruit. Like, you just were <laughs> awesome. Better, yeah, call back to uh, Daniela Velez's episode where we were talking about Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she came in with Apple the fruit, right. which was awesome. It was. As opposed to Apple the company, which, which we declared awful. was awful. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I... I, I enjoyed my very first smartphone was a blackberry it was mm. like a pro it was one of those really skinny ones so like my fat thumbs still could not handle the raised keyboard but um i thought it was a good introduction to the smartphone universe mm -hmm. but i don't know that i could ever go back go back i love yeah. the the text or the speech to text feature like you just press the microphone and you don't have to worry about the fat thumbs anymore right. i think everybody has that now though right? i think you're right yeah, but yeah that's so. yeah. yeah um you know, it's funny, one of the most embarrassing tech moments of my adult... No, we're going to wow. say my entire life. <laughs> wow! Um, we're in... Can't wait. This is the... Not the eye zone. The multi-purpose room at old BIA. You were talking about the old building yeah. across the street from the State House. And Frank hands me his phone, and he asked me to check something out. And I'm sitting there swooshing my finger across the screen for an unreasonable amount of time. It's like it felt like an hour, but it was probably like 20 seconds or so before it, like it did not even occur to me that like I had to press a physical button on the phone to move to like the next photo or something. I felt so embarrassed when it finally clicked in. Cause it's not like I'm so young that I wasn't here for like the, the flip phone sure. era and everything, but yeah. No, Aww. it's, I, I don't yeah. want to say awful or awesome. I've never owned one. Right. Uh, yeah, like we were at Grounds for Sculpture a few weeks ago. And uh, maybe if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll throw up a picture because I think I took one. There was a, a modern art kind of a thing of a couple, you know, cuddling in the grass, maybe with like a picnic kind of scenario going around them. And I was like, wow, based on the clothing and the hairstyles and everything, that had to be the last few years or so. <laughs> so then I see next to the guy's hand, there's a Blackberry. And I'm like, oh, it's got to be the 1920s now. <laughs> so then never mind. But yeah, I, I don't know. I've never owned one. So you recommend the new one, right? I, I based upon what I've seen, you know what? I'll buy one, try it out, and let you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You totally just made me nostalgic for my, my flip phone, my Razor. I had mm. a pink Razor. I loved the Razor. God, I loved the uh, Razor. They yeah. were so skinny, and you know, you could just Motorola. fit them in any. Yeah, mm. Motorola. Mm. Oh my God. You know what's funny? I, that phone was built to last. Like, I, yes, I still I used have to it. drop that all the time. Yes. And I remember one time I, I was walking to work, we were crossing the, the street. And I dropped my phone on the street and it shattered into like 12 pieces. Amazing. I picked them up like Legos, clicked them back together, <laughs> together, and the thing worked fine. Are you kidding? Not a crack, not a scratch. It's like, like a transformer. Exactly. Like it, <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. You know what would happen today if I, I dropped know. my phone on the street and it cracked into a thousand pieces? Yesterday. Forget, yesterday know? I dropped it and I've got tiny little spider webby cracks on the oh, screen no. now. I know. It's a matter of time. I've had this phone for years now. You don't have a screen protector on there? I no, I don't have a. I have a screen, um, like a glare thing, but I don't have a screen protector. And the the ca let's be real, the case is living just, dangerously. I know, I totally am. I want to do like a sidebar conversation here. So, is this the first time you've had a phone where the screen cracked? Yeah. 
Have you had that happen to you I've before? I've had it many a time over the years. All right, so how long are you willing to go before you replace this? As long as it takes. As long as it takes for what, though? Because we don't have the, the system anymore where you have to wait like the I know. two years or something. I know, but like it's just going to make my bill go up because they, there is no sale on the phone anymore. You don't bring that back and you right. get a credit for whatever, and then the $600 phone is only $200. Like, it's a $600 or a $900 yeah. phone, and they just break it up into a three-year contract, and that goes on to your monthly bill. My monthly bill is already like a hundred bucks yeah i don't want more i'm just gonna take it until the phone dies i've been thinking about it a lot because I, I get really worried about my phone and um i was curious like you know i i paid outright like i didn't do like the tacking onto your bill every wow month. mr money i know right, right? <laughs> but i was like if this thing breaks am i gonna be willing to drop another 600 like how long would i be willing right. to go that's something that I'm very interested in now, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, mark the date down, Ben. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if you're one of our readers and you've got a ridiculous amount of time or the exact opposite, yeah. like, drop it and you're, like, in the store the next day, yeah. let us know. I would, OPB at NJDIA.org. The only time I'm willing to go to the store and, like, get a new one is if it physically won't turn on anymore. Yeah. Because that's when I'm like, well, it defeats the purpose. Now it's just a paperweight. I need I need a phone that works. I've seen some people in our office. A shout out to Brian Sakurka. He had his phone like cracked all of the, yeah, the I've screen. Yeah, I've seen some smashed And it was phones. catching on like his beard and everything. Aww. And I was like, you got to change it at that point. Like, you know, if it's <laughs> causing you physical one, harm. You know? yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All, all right, right, so what else you got? Next up is junk food. Which, I gotta be honest, I have a love-hate relationship with junk food. Yeah. I, I love it. I mean, we have a candy drawer on, on our floor yeah, here at NJBIA, and I contributed to it. I contributed to the starting of the candy drawer, and I now contribute to filling it. Mm. Um, I try really hard not to get in there a lot, um, but boy, do I love junk food. Yeah, we have the... I was just going to say the drawer, and I've got in there once. I try really hard not to. Because yeah. Have you seen our, our drawer? I haven't. I, yeah. I, I don't want to see it. It's I'll take epic. a photo and throw it up on YouTube. It's it's basically like a, a treasure trove of candy and, yeah, like um, snacks. snacks and stuff. And it's it's always there. <laughs> and it's always replenished. Yeah. And so that is the most dangerous thing for me to work. Like, what is that, 20 feet away? I know. Yeah, like... Dangerous I stuff. actually have a, a good friend, a member of BIA, Courtney Villani from Villani Bus. Shout out to Courtney. Mm -hmm. So she had a baby a couple weeks, no, a couple months ago now. And at the christening, she had little individually wrapped Rice crispy bars. And I got to have one there. And it had been years probably since I'd had a homemade Rice crispy bar, which tastes way better than the prepackaged ones you can buy in the store. And based on that experience, I went home and I bought the ingredients. <laughs> and I them. now, it's like I'm in my third iteration. I, I've always got like a pan of Rice crispy bars on the counter and every night I let myself have one. And it is like the best, it's like the best moment of the day. <laughs> Do you share with your colleagues here at BIA? I do not. You do not. She doesn't uh, have to. Every day. Is in there. It's yeah. true. Vin is right. Every day there's something. Yeah. It's either that drawer or it's somebody's birthday yeah. or it's somebody's like graduation yeah. or something like that. I remember, um, shout out to Steve Wilson. He came down here once and, you know, he needed me for something. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm running off to a, a party. I think it's somebody's birthday. And he was like, all right. So then the next day we were talking and the same thing happened. I was like, yeah, I got to run off. To another party you gave me this look like every day and i'm like <laughs> apparently every day yeah isn't there a, a thing about the njbi 15 like when you start working here you're warned you're gonna gain weight i'm rocking mm. the njbia 60. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's up on the fourth floor where government affairs and yes. communication is. Our former uh, chief of government affairs, yes. um, Melanie Willoughby, was constantly bringing in junk food for all of us, which we, you know, it, it was nice having it in some ways, but also Melanie was always on a diet. Yeah. And God bless her. She looks great. She and, does. And she had Shout lost a lot Melanie. of weight. Yes, but it was Melanie. almost like she was, was eating through us. Right. And so here, you guys eat all <laughs> this junk food. <laughs> I won't eat that junk food. And, I want to watch you eat it. And she would watch <laughs> us eat it. And so we stopped. So um, and Melanie retired uh, a number of months ago, and we've been keeping our junk food to a minimum. We're trying Ooh. to bring in healthy food. Matter Ooh. of fact, my wife made uh, some zucchini bread, to bring, which I brought into the staff today Love. upstairs. And I was going to like share it with other people on other floors. Uh -huh. It's all gone. It's gone already. You want to know how crazy this is? This is not a, a lie, an exaggeration, nothing. We had zucchini bread on this floor yesterday. Really? No yeah. way. Roxanne Poandre made it. It was she great. It? Tastes like pumpkin. Uh, but like, this is how real it is on the second floor. Anything every day. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go with awful. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with awful. Uh, I'm going to go with awful. Okay. Oh, God, I love it so And then everybody will leave this taping and yeah, go, go for some, some food. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Exactly. All right, last one. Reenactments as in the Civil War or American Revolution reenactments. What do you got? I think they're awful. I mean, awesome. Pardon me. <laughs> pardon me. I think they're awesome. I mean, as a history nerd, um, I've always kind of secretly wanted to be a part of one, but, you know, women were not allowed really in either war. I mean, unless you dress up like a man. Um, so I don't know how that would work. But I think that they're really cool. But wait a minute. That's not true. Here in New Jersey, when they do, and I'm going to say awesome, in reenactments in New Jersey, one of the main characters in lots of reenactments. Clara Barton. Is, well, no, 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 Molly Pitcher. Oh. In the Battle of Monmouth. Um, there's oh, actually, there's a Mo right. There's a Molly Pitcher rest stop yes, there on is. the Turnpike. And Molly Pitcher, not only did she bring pitchers of water, that was the hottest battle in the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Monmouth in June of 1777 or something or other. Mm -hmm. And it was over 100 degrees on the battlefield. So guys both British and uh, American troops were dropping from heat exhaustion yeah. and sunstroke. Molly Pitcher kept, and that yeah. wasn't her real name, it was Molly yeah. Parker, I think, that she kept bringing pitchers of water to every butt. As people collapsed, she also was loading and firing a cannon. Wow. And so she, when they do depictions uh, of the Battle of Monmouth, Molly Pitcher is front and center. So you, I stand Kate, corrected. I'm, I'm going to nominate something. Kate to be Molly Pitcher next year right. in the reenact. Done. Yeah, but, I was going to say Harriet Tubman with the Civil War, another MVP, but yeah. not necessarily in the military. She wouldn't have been in, in a reenactment, though, but she certainly was part of the... Uh, sure. The underground. I don't know what they do during the reenactments. Like what? They stage battles. Yeah. Yeah. Said, well, and not every day, but many days, not a block from here, was the where the Battle of Trenton took yeah, place, place the on Christmas Eve. Yeah, in they crossed the and, river again, right? They crossed the, the Delaware, Washington crossed the Delaware about 13 miles up the road from town. And at the old barracks, which is a, a, a block from here, that's where the Hessian troops were uh, stationed. And on a very regular basis, they have come out and changing of the, the guard of the Hessian troops, and they do reenactments right here in Trenton of that battle. So you could actually that. do that, too. I want to do that. I, I mentioned earlier to the, the gang that for years, member of the General Assembly, Michael Patrick Carroll, who recently spoke at a, at a BIA event, um, who is, is very, very uh, much a libertarian. He's a Republican, but he's a libertarian. And that on Tax Freedom Day, that day usually in May in the state of New Jersey, when you've worked for a couple of months to pay all the taxes you owe to your, your property taxes, your federal taxes, your state taxes, and that you are free of now paying your taxes for the year, Michael Patrick Carroll would come to Trenton and uh, he would do this either that day or budget day and wear his uniform from the Revolutionary War. Now, he wasn't in the Revolutionary War, <laughs> yeah, but he had his tri-corner <laughs> hat and his white wig and his long uh, coat. And sometimes, and I, I never, actually never saw this, but somebody said he brought a flag that said, don't tread on me. Hmm. But he would give a speech from the perspective of give me liberty and don't give me taxes. So we had an enactment almost every year in the legislature for a long time. Wow. Yeah, so awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I was just thinking about this. You know what would be a really cool way to modernize it? I don't know. Maybe that's like against the concept, but I would love to participate in something like that where you had like paintballs or, or something <laughs> like that. You know? like, like we could we could rechain, we could rewrite history, you know, like whoever wins the paintball, you know, competition. Oh You'd have to God. figure out how to fire a paintball from a seventeenth uh, century. <laughs> <Like, laughs> figure that out. Yeah. That, that or you know, they could just be like the, the silly paintball guns or whatever, but like That's the real hilarious. uniforms and the, the real battlefield, you know. All right, well you referred to yourself as a history nerd a little yeah. while ago. Yeah. In in relation to what you just said, do you know that when Lewis and Clark took their expedition across America. They after played paintball? Opponent, <laughs> they had air guns. Oh. There was a, guns that were made in Europe in the late 17, early 1800s that used air pressure. They didn't use gunpowder. And they actually had, to, they had this pump. They would pump up through a cylinder in this stock of the rifle and it shot bullets by air pressure. So they could probably load those yeah. with paintballs. <laughs> and you can get it. We're going to look into that. Too. I was just thinking, like, all right, if I'm like Lewis it. and Clark walking tank. around yeah. and you fill it with maybe, like, you know, debris, like leaves and, you know, mud or whatever, <laughs> right. and you shoot it into, like, the other one's leg and they're like, 
I'm really sick of walking across the country <laughs> with this guy. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm thinking about- How about we about... split up? I'll take this head, you oh take this head. Seriously, I'm thinking about the rock salt sawed off shotgun mm. scene in um, Kill Bill. Mm. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. But I read a book about reenactments and it was amazing. Mm. Did you ever read um, Confederates in the Attic? No. It's I about this man who takes the summer off and he kind of travels around the South mm. and he kind of hooks up with different reenactment groups. And uh, the experience was just amazing. The book was great. Cool. Yeah, but um, I'm a big fan of Rune. And I think that, that that's the game. I think it's we all answered, right? Wow. All right, so Frank, um, what's the Government Affairs Department and NJBIA been up to lately? Lately? Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that we spent a lot of time this past June uh, regarding the state budget. Uh, there were some things in there that we weren't too pleased with, including the raising of some taxes, and we spent a lot of time on that. In the summertime, um, once the legislature normally doesn't come in after it passes the budget in the end of June, beginning of July, and we were a little late with the budget this year, but state government did not close down, which was a good thing. That's only happened once in modern history, and that was about, oh, I don't know, like 10 years ago. Um, and uh, so we, they averted that. So we had staff here during that, that whole period, um, met with lots of legislators, people from the governor's office to get our point of view across because we we've thought for years that new jersey doesn't really have a revenue problem we have a spending problem mm -hmm. and so we try to educate people is that you know there's a certain limit you can get to in terms of taxing people and by yeah. most measures new jersey is the most taxed state in the country when you count in everything federal tax the state income tax our corporate business tax property tax is highest in the nation mm -hmm. so we're constantly talking about that now that we're in the summer break, uh, we're spending a lot of time going out and meeting with new legislators. We had an unusual amount of new legislators come into the, um, uh, the state legislature, mostly the General Assembly, but also in the Senate, because Governor Murphy pulled a lot of experienced people out of the legislature to be in his administration. Mm -hmm. A number of the cabinet officers, including the, uh, um, the Treasury uh, Secretary, uh, is uh, from the state legislature, uh, the, the Commissioner of Banking and Insurance. So they've had special appointments and so we've been going to meet those people. I think so far this summer we've probably met with about a dozen new members of the legislature well, and just trying to build up a relationship, getting them to understand who we are who and who we represent and the kind of issues that we're concerned with. And we're concerned at, at BIA, we're concerned in a lot of things, especially um, in the last five to ten years and issues that people are, why are you guys involved with things like education? Mm. Education is a big focus of things that we do because having a well-educated, well-trained, skilled workforce is incredibly important to business in this state. And we spend a huge amount of money between property taxes and the state uh, appropriations. We spend about $40 billion a year on uh, kindergarten through 12th grade education. Okay. And so a lot of that comes from property taxes, but also a lot of it comes from the corporate business tax and from the income tax. And business pays a lot of those taxes. And the final product are the, uh, the kids, hopefully, well-trained for the jobs of now, but not just now, but also for the future. We spend a lot of time on innovation, mm -hmm. on education, as I mentioned. Uh, we're very much involved in the STEM uh, portion of education, of science and technology and engineering and math. Because, quite frankly, not just New Jersey, but the whole United States is really sort of getting our uh, head handed to us by a lot of foreign countries that are training their kids in those, uh, yeah. those disciplines. And we've kind of fallen behind in that. Mm -hmm. So we've been big proponents of that. And I'd like, uh, the government, government, whether it was under Democrats or Republicans, uh, has um, awakened to that fact in the last mm -hmm. number of years and have been very, very supportive on um, making sure that we have kids trained for good jobs when they come out of school. Right. So I'll be working on that. There's other issues in the fall. We talked about the mandates earlier. We anticipate a debate over um, minimum wage. Uh, over expanding uh, paid family leave. There's going to be a whole debate about marijuana in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, the association has not um, taken any formal position on it right now because we haven't seen any bills on it. Mm -hmm. But there's three issues when it comes to marijuana. It's one, decriminalization. 
two, legalization, and then three, the expansion of medical marijuana, yeah. which is different than the, the sure. legalization. And um, we are monitoring it. We're talking to a lot of people about it. Um, the major concern that our employers have brought to us is workplace safety. If marijuana becomes legal, um, right now there's there's lots of different drug and uh, substance abuse um, guidelines in the workplace, especially in factories and people who, you know, drivers and things like that. And there's testing programs for that. Uh, with marijuana, there's currently no valid short-term test mm -hmm. for marijuana like like blood tests that we you have know, like right alcohol, now, breathalyzer, yeah. breathalyzer right. and that, and that is a concern for us, and we want to make sure that those concerns are heard. So we've been talking to lots of legislators about that. We'll continue that, but at this point in time, we don't have a formal position on it. We just want to be looking out for the employers. Sure, mm -hmm. great. So actually, you would be a, a particularly good person to answer my next question based on you know what you've done here over uh -oh. the years. But let's just say somebody wants to get involved in NJBIA's government affairs. Let's say they're mm -hmm. a member. They want to come out and do something. They want to be part of the conversation. How do they go about that? Well, we have a lot of things that we do in government affairs and, and in cooperation with everybody else here at the association. We have a great events team and marketing team. We have uh, a number of uh, events every year that uh, besides the great things that we do for mm -hmm. our members in terms of our affinity programs and HR issues um, and, and summits on big policy areas, we also have a thing called Meet the Decision Maker series, which we have five, six, seven every year. And what we do is we have um, the state treasurer, the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, mm -hmm. the president of the Board of Public Utilities, uh, the commissioner of the Department of Labor. And they come in and we usually do these events in conjunction with the State Chamber of Commerce, who partners with us. And we usually have 75, 100, 150 people come in and hear from these policy, these decision makers in government, and then you get to interact with them. You mm -hmm. get to ask them questions. They're, they take all questions. And so if you own a very small business or work as a government affairs person for a major corporation, this is a great opportunity for you to get exposure to these people who do it. Years ago, they never did it. I mean, when I first got involved in politics, you would never find somebody from the governor's mm -hmm. cabinet or the Board of Public Utilities coming and speak before business groups. The last 10, 15 years, uh, we've really gotten cooperation, both out of Democratic and Republican administrations. And so people have gotten to meet um, their commissioners and their secretaries of this um, and people that govern them by their policies yeah. every day. And so people get exposure to that. We also have a whole series of issue uh, policy committees. And uh, so if you're interested in HR, if you're interested in taxation subjects, if you're interested in um, the environment or employment law, uh, we have policy committees that meet quarterly uh, and you can get involved with. And usually those are meetings between 25 and 50 people. A lot of them are held right here at our headquarters in Trenton. And you get the opportunity. Sometimes we'll bring in, we'll really get into the weeds because people want to find out, our members want to find out, well, how do I comply with a certain law? So we'll bring in a deputy commissioner uh, from one of the departments who deals with regulations because a lot of our business members have to deal with, we, we make the laws and then somebody's got to implement those laws and that's mm -hmm. done by regulation. In the regulatory process, we spend a lot of time on that also because the, the legislature may say that we think that the state should do this and the governor signs it. Then somebody's got to make sure that the, that, that thing is done and that's regulated by the various departments. And they sometimes maybe go a little bit beyond the intent mm -hmm. of certain leg re uh, regula legislation through the regulation. So we look at that. So we give people the opportunity to understand those regulations. Uh, it's very much in the weeds, but if somebody wants to, we provide them the opportunity. We also, I mean, I mentioned some of the other programs we do. we're going to do this fall, as we've done almost every year, uh, a, a summit on health care. Mm -hmm. uh, since health Health insurance uh, is one of the major cost drivers for yeah. the businesses in the state. So we'll, we, we do things to explain the mandates that we talked about earlier um, and things that you need to do and have to do if you are giving your employees health insurance. You don't have to, by the law, but most of our employers do provide some kind of health insurance to people. So we'll, we'll do like a whole half day. Uh, about about that. We recently have done things on innovation, mm -hmm. uh, on uh, 
the tale of tech cities. Yeah. And so we do lots of different kinds of events there. Government Affairs is involved with it. But once again, I said we have a great uh, marketing and events and communications staff that help puts that together, too. So we give people <laughs> lots of opportunity um, to yeah. uh, be involved. Also, too, one of the things that Kate is very, very uh, much responsible for at BIA mm -hmm. is our partnership program. Yeah. And, and government affairs, I mean, almost everybody in the building is involved in one way, shape, or form. And we give companies, whether you're large or small, the opportunity to come and network with other people and, and have a display table or be on, on a panel. Have visibility. And visibility. And a lot of companies have availed themselves of that. Not only big companies, we have, we have great uh, partners like New Jersey Manufacturers mm -hmm. Insurance, AT&T, Verizon, Horizon, all the major corporations, but also a lot of the smaller companies in the state have found it a great opportunity to set up a table and, and talk to our, and some of our events, we have hundreds of people mm -hmm. and give them the opportunity to promote themselves to fellow business people. Absolutely. There's and a the price ELCs, point. right? I'll go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, there's okay. a price point for everybody. We, we mm -hmm. try to really hard to customize packages to make sure that they're affordable for everybody. Absolutely. As we know, the, I mean, the cost of doing business. Then he just mentioned the ELC, the ELC something right. that's near and dear to my heart. That's why when I originally I like, alley you well, there, I, I threw up the ball. I, I was like, Frank in particular. No, you know, and <laughs> I was going to end with that oh, okay. uh, oh, as my swan song. Okay. Um, <laughs> the employer legislative committees were started by NJBIA. Um, as sort of a local way for people to, uh, who didn't have the time to come to Trenton or to come to big statewide events, to get to meet the policymakers from their area, for the most part, right in their home counties. Mm -hmm. So uh, they was, these were founded in 1959 by the association in conjunction with uh, local business people or members of BIA, uh, in conjunction with local chambers of commerce. And um, not all of them meet all the time, and they haven't since 1959, but on a regular basis, sometimes it's quarterly, sometimes it's monthly, um, 25 to 100 people will sit down. There's no cost to join other than you pay for a meal. We normally have a breakfast or a lunch. In the old days, there were a lot of three martini lunches. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and But we do a lot of breakfast so people can get in and out, meet with a local state senator, a mayor, uh, sometimes people, uh, members of the governor's cabinet, mm -hmm. um, and uh, get the opportunity to really mix and mingle um, on a local basis. Once again, it costs 10, anywhere from 10 to $30, mm -hmm. depending upon the meal, and uh, get the opportunity. We recently in Union County, in Cates County, who, by the way, Kate, uh, in her former That's life, right. was chair. We have local chair people uh, of these ELCs, and Kate was chair of our union ELC right. for a number of years. And now that she lives up that way, sometimes I get to sleep in, <laughs> and Kate will go to the early morning breakfast and represent BIA, and she does a, does a great, great job. No pressure at all. I have no to fill his shoes for a morning and talk intelligently about politics and Trenton. Oh, my well, God. Maybe I'll make my you go to the nightmare. next one. Uh, we're having Mayor Bullwidge uh, next week <laughs> as the mayor, 26-year mayor of Elizabeth, uh, in the city of Elizabeth in Union County will be the speaker at the Union ELC wow. a week from tomorrow. Uh, we recently had Senator Joe Cryan yep. uh, was a speaker at Union County. Mm -hmm. we, um, who, Senator who was Lesniak was a frequent... Uh, Senator Lesniak, uh, Lieutenant speaker. Governor uh, yep. Kim Guadano oh, used to, as a matter of fact, we gave her an award because she went to every ELC at least once and there she were did. 19 of them. Uh, over the course of the time she was lieutenant governor, many of them she went to a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Christie Jamel uh, Holly. was many of them. Uh, Jamel Holly, assemblyman mm -hmm. up there. But uh, when Chris Christie was the U.S. attorney, he used to do the circuit for NJBI before he was famous. <laughs> before he was famous, <laughs> and he would come and he talk. He would talk about. Remember, Chris became the U.S. attorney right after 9/11. And so, I mean, all the the apparatus of federal government, at least, and a lot yeah. of the state, too, were really focused on terrorism. And uh, and Chris did a good job. They actually prosecuted a few people when he was the U.S. attorney. But he was also very much, he was crusading against political corruption. Yeah. Which Sharp it, it, it's a cause, which is a cost of doing business in New Jersey. Yeah. It really is um, a bad cost. And uh, it can inflate the things. I mean, uh, some people were forced to pay bribes that added hundreds of thousands of dollars to development. Right. 
right. contract. And so that's the way uh, former Governor Christie made his name, was as a U.S. attorney. Right. And remember, uh, one day they, we were in an office in the old building, and Frank, a uh, phone call for you. Uh, who is it? It's the U.S. attorney. I, oh, my God. Am I in trouble? <laughs> I had worked in Hudson County politics. Getting for a indicted. I'm like, oh no, tell, tell, them, t- tell them I'm not here. I'm to, gone for the day. To, uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. U.S. Attorney. Uh, Frank's in the office. Tell Frank that there's nothing to do about any legal problem. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Mr. U.S. Attorney, Frank, call me Chris. Yes, sir. Uh, and he said, hey, I think I heard you've got these things called the ELCs. And this goes back to like 2003. Mm-hmm. Uh, he became U.S. Attorney in 2002. And uh, he said, look, I've got lots of things I'm trying to do um, regarding gang violence, how that's affecting our cities. And a lot of our employers are in the big cities in the state. And we're talking about corruption in government and other things that the U.S. Attorney Office has done. Have you ever had a U.S. Attorney come speak to your ELCs? And I said, not since I've been around. And so he started coming on a regular basis. He was actually very, very informative. It's funny because my Democratic friends were very upset that I was giving Chris Christie a platform because you know he's going to run for governor someday. I'm like, no, he's not. Oh, my God. Even back then, (laughs) everybody knew he was going to be the next governor. I but so but uh, we've had lots of great people. I mean, U.S. senators have come and spoken at these meetings. Is it governors, um, U.S. attorneys, Mm -hmm. uh, state legislators, mayors, uh, local offices? uh, you know, county like clerks. county clerks, county freeholders. Yeah. So it's been great. It's a good opportunity. And so once again, we put it on our website all the time. We send notices <clears throat> out to our members about when the meetings are coming up. Um, so, um, you know, you can just go to the njbia.org and look under advocacy mm-hmm. and then build a list of all the ELC meetings. Yeah, I was going to say, if you type njbia.org slash advocacy, it brings mm-hmm. you right to all the stuff that Frank was talking about. And I started going to them in, um, actually started going to them when I worked in the legislature. I was occasionally a guest speaker at them myself. And then when I came here at BIA, uh, I was asked if I wanted to take them over. And I said, sure, fine. And I've never really regretted it except for those mornings when I would leave my house at 5.30 a.m. to be in Sussex County God. by 8 a.m. Mm, and it, I, I joke that sometime in the not too distant past that I celebrated my 748th ELC that I went to <laughs> since being here at BIA. And it's really not that many, but I've literally been to hundreds and hundreds of them. And nine out of 10, to 99 out of 100, I've enjoyed them. Yeah, mm. they're good. They're enjoyable. Okay, right, so that's our show. I think that's our show. Thank you to subscribers and listeners. We appreciate the support. Thank you to New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, the official sponsor of the show. They do home, auto, and workers' comp, so check them out if you're in the market for updated coverage. And finally, thank you to our very own Frank Robinson. We appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you giving me the idea to wear sunglasses on the show. I know. We're totally doing that someday. It's those harsh lights. But th- thank you to you two of doing an absolutely fabulous job. Oh, I've only listened Thanks. to bits and pieces of your mm-hmm. show. Now I'm going to listen to it all the time. Well, but you you've really gotten... you have to listen to this episode. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to tell all my friends not uh, to, but you know, other people's business. It, it, it's growing in reputation, and I want to congratulate both Kate and Vin for a great job. Thank, oh, thank you, you so much. Okay. All right. See you next time. Later. Yeah.